the third in BIC series that documents interesting people and the fascinating interests and hobbies that occupy them. This edition is all about locks and keys. V. Raghunathan, academic, author, columnist and hobbyist, collects rare ancient Indian locks. Meena and Raghu welcomed us into their home to allow us a peek into this collection and the stories it holds. Which is your favorite heist film? Oh, money heist. Which else? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, I came into lock collection about as soon as I entered the world of academia, which is about 37 years ago when I was just joining I am Ahmedabad. In Ahmedabad, there is on the uh, river Sabarmati bed, there is a flea market called Aitwari. So I used to frequent that place uh, regularly and uh, so we used to, uh, you know, keep going there to look for old furniture, old Things. And that's where I started seeing locks to start with. And uh, so I have been an academic for about 20 years at uh, IMA. Then I was heading the ING Vaisha Bank uh, here for about uh, four years. Thereafter, I headed the foundation of the GMR group. I'm also an author and a visiting professor in Europe and North America. So that's my brief background. But my lock collection today, I think I'm probably better known for my law collection than for anything else that I may have done, including my books. But uh, yeah, it's a 37-year-old hobby. Long ago, I think in 1997 or 99, which uh, this is 99, uh, you know, Limca book, people got to know about uh, my collection. And then they came and uh, included this as, of course, Limca typically goes by numbers. Limca record is not about anything else but numbers. At that time, maybe I had the largest number among the people known to them. Today, I'm sure many people have uh, more than I, what I have. But uh, uh, because there are people who collect uh, of the same kind, they would collect 100, 200 of them box full because they're available as junks. So, but then the number game becomes very different. So today, I think there are other people. But many people, uh, at least I know personally four or five collectors of whom at least one or two have a much, uh, you know, very superior collection could be, mine may be comparable, but theirs may even be better. I don't know. I haven't seen them fully. There's one Dr. Hiran Shah in Ahmedabad, who is a major collector among the best known that I know of. So, yeah, so that's uh, the locks. Veera Gunatham of Ahmedabad has a collection of 275 different locks. You can see it goes back <laughs> quite some time. You know, we had just got married, my wife, Meena and I, and uh, we were holidaying in Gulmark. And the little cottage that we were staying in, as we were checking out, there was this old lock, which I could show you later. And it looked fascinating. It didn't look like anything that we normally see on a daily basis. And there was a tourist shop right there. So I offered to the uh, Chokida, said, if I buy you a new lock, will you give me this old one? And uh, he thought I was an idiot to give him a new lock for an old one. I thought he was an idiot to give me an old lock for a new one. So it was a win-win exchange. And that was a very unique one. Thereafter, we were we are both Tamilians, but we have never lived down south. We are both born and brought up in Delhi, Punjab, Haryana, and so on. So we were uh, going around uh, Tamil Nadu uh, with temple architecture as a, a theme when we landed up in my old grandparents' house. And there was an old lock hanging over there, which looked somewhat different again. So I picked that up. And then I told you about this Aitwari on the Sabarmati riverbed. I picked up one more. Now I had three locks. None of them looked like what we have and not like any of each other. That is what picked my interest because I've always had a thing for collecting. You know, some people are acquisitive, some are not. I was the accusative kind who would collect anything from matchbox covers as a kid to whatever, fountain pens and things like those. So I got into this because I liked anything mechanical and anything old and what was affordable, you know. So that is how I really got into it. And 
then it started growing and growing and growing. Uh, wherever I went, I would go to the flea markets, but I concentrated only on Indian locks primarily because it's our heritage that you want to keep in India. Though accidentally, I might have chanced upon a few locks from Central Asia and so on, or even China and so forth, but predominantly my locks are all Indian. Of course, in terms of sheer numbers, I may have about 650 to 700, which doesn't sound very large, but these are typically different locks. Each one is a single piece of its kind. Yes, I have about uh, 650 to 700 locks. They range in various kinds of mechanisms, various kinds of metals, various kinds of tricks involved, size involved, the weight of them. The smallest is about half a centimeter wide. The biggest is about uh, two and a half feet roughly. The smallest is about three grams. The heaviest is about 25 kilograms. There are locks with one key, two key, three key, going up to five keys in my collection, though some people have even more. Uh, and many of them have soft keys. It's like the knowledge of uh, where the keyhole is or how to insert the key or in which order to insert the different keys, they're like soft keys. So you now have some hard keys and some soft keys and the permutation of them can get fairly complex. There are locks uh, which uh, ring a bell if you try to open them. There are locks which you lock from one side, but you close it from the other side. And, uh, you know, so I could go on and there are locks with various visuals. You know, there are locks which look like animals, which look like gods or famous personalities or objects like a revolver or a flower pot or whatever. You know, so a whole lot of uh, themes uh, along those lines. And many of them, for, for example, what you see there on the table there, that's a lock, that lady there. It doesn't look like a lock at all, but that lady is a lock. So essentially, uh, a lot of art goes in in some cases, but a lot of uh, imagination goes in most of them. And some of them are even fantastical creatures, you know, a leopard body with a cow's leg and a face of an elephant and, you know, complex creatures of those, which, which basically were made in an era where you didn't have safe locking devices. So each lock was a handmade lock and the trick was the safety that you had in the absence of a bank locker or whatever. Or these locks with five keys, for instance, would involve, uh, you know, if five brothers owned a shop, you didn't trust anybody to reach there early and take some sugar out or whatever. So all five had to be present to open the cash box or uh, the shop or whatever. Uh, this is a book uh, called Locks, Mahabharata and Mathematics, an exploration of unexpected parallels by Harper Collins. In this book, I tell uh, various stories from Mahabharata and some parallel of those stories with some of the locks in my collection and some parallel of some mathematical principles akin to both the stories as well as the locks. Okay, So it weaves in and out of uh, the Mahabharata story, the locks, mathematics comes out and goes in. So basically it's a fun book on divergent thinking. You, you know, how do you link locks to uh, a story? Locks can be linked more easily to mathematics maybe because they're all by, you know, binary digital coding is all about locking, unlocking and so on. But even so, you know, how do you come out with 20 different locks with some 20 different stories and how do you relate to them? Uh, in the previous life, Draupadi uh, uh, did this big tapasya. Those days, if you wanted any big boon, you would do some tapasya. And God will suddenly appear and say, okay, what do you want? And then you'll ask and then he'll say tathastu and disappear. And you'll get that. So she said, I want a husband who's wise, who's very brave, who's very uh, high on dharma, who's extremely handsome, and who's a scholar par excellence. So uh, Lord Shiva said, look, guys, even with one quality, don't come so often. You want five qualities in one guy. Where am I going to get you? She said, sorry, but I've done my tapasya. So he says, okay, in your next life, you'll get all the five qualities in your marriage. So in the next life, the five guys, each one had one property. <laughs> and so she got all the five properties in her marriage, but not in one husband, in five different husbands. Then you talk about this lock, which had five keys, for example. Okay, uh, so there, there's one lock, but there are five uh, keys. 
like there was one Draupadi and there were five Pandavas, or there is you know one un, uh, so, uh, one problem to be solved and five unknown simultaneous equations uh, with uh, five variables and so on. So things like those you move in and out, you know. Okay, here are some uh, sketching that I've done. I had started it as a project to demonstrate how each lock works, but I never got to completing it because the numbers grew faster than I could draw them. For instance, it tells you step by step how a certain lock works. So basically, the idea is that if I disappear from the landscape today, most of these locks can never be opened. So I thought I'll try and demonstrate all of them for posterity. So that is what these are supposed to be for, but now I think one has to do all this digitally and so on. I'll just come to her. here is a more complex one here, which is a very complex lock, which opens in about five or six different steps. You see, in India, we never had a culture of organizations of anything much. Guilds were relatively unknown in India. Guilds were more a European, English kind of a phenomenon. Nor has India ever had a documentation culture. See, if you go to Europe, you can get books which will tell you uh, Louis XIV furniture of this period, in this condition, what is the estimated value and so forth. In India, you have absolutely nothing. There are not even any historical books on locks available. There may be coffee table books, pictorial books. I've been to most libraries in India, abroad, even overseas, books on uh, uh, lock history are not very common at all, for instance. And in India, even worse, because we don't have a documentation culture. So there is no association of lock collectors, because in India, if there are three people who build a house, each one paints his balcony different. You know, we, we don't agree on any one damn thing. So it has never happened. But yes, there is an international association of lock collectors called Antique Lock Collectors. Uh, I am an invited member of sorts, because uh, to be a full member, it's very difficult. Every year they hold their meetings uh, in different places in the country. There are about 80 collectors. And each of them designs a lock of his or her own, makes 80 copies, goes to the seminar, and exchanges with 80 other collectors and come back with a rich haul. Now in India, I can't even find somebody with a good workmanship to make 80 copies of anything. So I don't really uh, participate full time, but I get all their uh, literature. I mean, there's a quarterly that comes. I've even been featured in their quarterly magazine and so on. It's called Antique Lock Collectors Quarterly. So, so but, but they're also part of Puzzle Collecting Association because many of these locks are trick locks. So they're like mechanical puzzles. So there are international interest is more as lock puzzles than locks per se. People have made locks with 23 keys, for example, which is more as a challenge to say that, look, I can make a lock which you cannot crack. Because among lock makers, it's a big deal to be able to make an uncrackable lock. And often you will hear it said that there is no such thing as an uncrackable lock. Because if somebody can design a lock, somebody can undesign its opening. And of course, in today's context, when we talk about locks, you're talking about zero and one. You're talking about coding and decoding. You know, so uh, the, the entire, uh, the principle remaining the same, it's become digital today, for instance. And there are the codes, for example, of the Second World War that we talk about, uh, the coding and decoding mechanism, they're basically locks. And they're in a very different kind of, a, you know, it's, it's a cracking a message, uh, for instance. Uh, the cruder version, I have a lock, you open the lock, inside there's a small box into which one could put a uh, secret message, okay? And then lock the thing and it goes somewhere, so. International locks will be more, uh, I mean, they'll be limited to about max 250 years or thereabouts, you know? Not as old as some of these, like India and China probably go back. And historically, from my travels from China to uh, the West, uh, Europe, it probably followed the Silk Route. Because uh, China, you know, of course, there are, there's a parallel thing about Egypt, who had wooden locks and so on in those days. 
But uh, many of these locks, the mechanism, the basic mechanism of springs and screws seems to follow the silk route. Uh, the workmanship in Europe is obviously much better than Indian workmanship. The metallurgy in Europe is purer than Indian metallurgy because Indian metallurgy was typically bastardized. You know, they would just put anything that could melt together and, you know, make a lock out of it. So looking at metallurgy, you can't date an Indian lock. In fact, those are some of the big challenges. You know, how do you date a lock? Because you can't do radiocarbon testing. But they are for much older uh, aging and so forth. And metallurgy is not pure. So how do you date it? So it's all a guesswork and there's no documentation available. So these are some of the challenges of having a collection. My oldest lock, the estimated dating is about 700 years. It's the only lock in my collection which is non-functioning without a key. And it has some parts missing which I have added with silver. There's a leg missing which I've added, a silver leg. There's a slide slat missing which conceals the keyhole which I've added with silver. Uh, inside everything is completely frozen as one solid mass. So there's no question of fitting a key to it. But that's about the oldest. But the bulk of them will be in the 200 to 300 year age gap. Today, France has a good lock museum, Italy has a good lock museum, Germany has a good lock museum and uh, finish wise I have seen Italian and German locks extremely well finished, even the medieval ones going back very, very well finished. Uh, and even in terms of ingenuity and so on, some of their uh, locks are engineering marvels actually. Okay. Uh, but, but I would think uh, they picked up from where Chinese left and built upon it. Like, like Renaissance, you know, everything exploded during Renaissance, whether it was science, technology, art, culture. So I would imagine lock making also came somewhere in that region. Till the Yale and all took over and then the whole, it became a science of locks. It was no longer an art of locks. Uh, during the Victorian era, it was written that they used to have uh, chastity bells for women. Yeah. Fact or fiction? It is definitely a fact. I've even seen one in London in one of the museums. Uh, of course, my ambition in life was to try and get one, which I never could, of course. <laughs> it's a padlock. <laughs> but usually, they also used to have a padlock on them, many of them. Okay, Many of them used to have a separate padlock on those. Uh, so yes, the chastity belt is a very much of a reality in the... But in a very, no, not very widespread and some very, very niche pockets in the very, very orthodox, uh, this thing of UK particularly, and some parts of uh, uh, continental Europe. Uh, but they're very rare and they cost a bomb and, uh, the, you know, not easy to afford. Actually, even animals lock. You see, when a squirrel takes a nut and hides it under the ground, what is it doing? The knowledge of where it is, is the key. Okay, so hiding is locking. Basically, we are doing exactly the same thing, but because we are a little more evolved, we are doing it a little better. Okay, But otherwise, any, any cat which uh, kills a rat and hides it under some debris is basically <laughs> locking away in a larder. Right? So, yes, in that sense, uh, hiding is uh, very, very basic to organisms. And uh, human beings are no different, except we have figured smarter ways of doing it. That's all. This is from the Mughal period. It's a usual combination lock, but what is unusual is each alphabet looking thing here is part of, I mean the whole thing is a, any random combination is an ayat from Quran. This is all in Arabic. So any random combination is an ayat from Quran, a particular ayat would actually open the lock. The, the, the whole uh, magic, the whole uh, lure of these old mechanical locks is something else altogether. And in fact, that's precisely why people like me collect, you know, so the, the touch and feel of it gives us a high, which you can never do with a digital lock. You don't touch and feel it. In India, there are a few places which are good for lock. Rajasthan, Gujarat is one belt. Kerala is another belt. Then Ladakh, Leh, Jammu, Kashmir, the, that side is yet another belt, and Aligarh. South, of course, has other uh, Dindikal and so on, but they are relative, uh, you know, 19th century onwards kind of locks. They are basically the current kind of locks, but 
there's there's an industry there in Dindigal. But Dindigal is not for ancient locks. Even Aligarh can go back up maximum 250 years or thereabouts when the industry started there. But some of the really older locks will go to Rajasthan and uh, including Pakistan because see this Rajasthan, Gujarat, and all are our current boundary uh, definitions. Old Pakistan, Sindh, and so on. They they are all the same belt, and you can see a lot of locks in this region. You see, locksmithing itself traditionally was a handed down craft. Uh, like every village will have one cobbler, one barber, one locksmith. You know, one um, uh, fitting the shoes for the uh, horses and so on. It probably was like that. But ever since the lock got into the production mode, you know, onto the uh, uh, regular production, it started dying out because it was no longer worth it. When easier locks, much cheaper, were available. people didn't see sense and you know especially the onset of banking and so on the lockers and so forth uh, removed the need for many of these locks for example uh, you know i have a lock which opens with one key but closes with another key now it had a sense in one time when if you had a maid working at home or your shop assistant in the shop you said okay you close the shop and go away or close the house and go away but you didn't want them to have the right to re enter so you had the other key which would the same keyhole or two different keyholes but one key for entering one for exiting now once banks and all came the knee or this automatic doors came in for instance the need for those kinds of locks obviously disappeared so once the need disappeared and villagers could also access uh, uh, mass production locks i think it started becoming a dying uh, 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 profession in fact i had challenges earlier when i was living in ahmedabad maybe in the 80s or early 90s also till then i had a 85 year old man who used to fit some keys for me because sometimes during my collection i would find a lock which would be locked so i had to decode how it worked and sit with the locksmith who understood old locks and i understood them also so we would sit together and make okay one of them took me three keys because three different keys took 10 hours of work for us to make the lock functioning that man died now such a person is not easily replaceable because his son doesn't do that anymore because it's not worth it uh, so yes uh, it was a family tradition once upon a time but no longer so in fact the, there's not even a second generation lock maker of a of the old variety left anymore yes aligarh is full of uh, entrepreneurs who make this brass locks and trick locks and so on but uh, that is different from the kind of a traditional uh, 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 father to son kind of a industry that you have in mind that doesn't happen anymore Raghu also presented the workings of some choice pieces from his collection to a captivated live audience. Now actually I want to switch tracks and show some so can we pick some locks Raghu and I'd like you to walk us through them preferably it's going to be a little bit of a puzzle for you locks that didn't make the movie I hope you brought some of them yeah and some of course which made the movie as uh, uh, raghu is going to walk us through some of those lock stories and uh, how we actually crack some of them and some of them are really puzzles as he said though they look like hardware they are software elements in terms of how do you uh, operate those locks for it to open so raghu if you could move that. there and that. give us a demonstration yeah you know when i 
thought we'll bring some locks, uh, you know, more as a sampling here. I was in two minds whether I should bring more of those which were not covered here at all or bring more of those which were covered here because then it could reinforce what you had already seen. So I have brought two or three which were not featured here, but the rest are essentially reiteration of what we have already seen because I'll be talking about what is in it which is special. You see, now here is one lock. If you see it anywhere, you actually do not see any keyhole opening. Okay? You see this? You don't see any keyhole opening. But you do see something like a latch here. So you will obviously first think that you need to move that latch. This is the latch. Now if I move that latch, for example, aha, here, here it is, right. Now I have moved the latch, the key has gone in. You see, now the key doesn't turn. But if I move this latch up, the key turns. The key is turned. But even now the latch doesn't open. There is a little button here. You have to push this button, then it opens. So there are three or four additional steps with which the lock actually works. So you close this and you turn the key, everything else will automatically fall in place. But while opening, you need three different steps for the lock to open. Now, here is one big lock. You see this? Do you see any keyhole anywhere? What I will be happy to do with this one lock is I'll pass it around. Just quickly pass it on and see whether you see any way you can even get to the first base of how this may work. This is the one which rings a bell. The idea is if someone is picking the lock on the quiet while you are sleeping next, door, next room, it can't be done on the quiet. Okay, so that is what this is about. Now this is a very unusual lock, the like of which we normally do not see. Look at this. This looks like a traditional lock and it does not look like a combination lock at all. Because combination locks, we know, they usually come in those circular disks. This looks like a regular lock. But when you keep the key on top of the lock and bring these little tumblers to the key level, These are all set here against the key. You see this key is designed and all of these are set here. The lock opens. So once you keep it here and scramble these, anyone who doesn't have the key will not know where these go. And that's how the, so it's actually a combination lock but doesn't look like a combination lock. This is a scorpion, each limb of it is movable. This is the key. And if you don't have the right key, holding the lock becomes a big problem because they're all sharp points. And if you're trying to fool around with it, trying to fit a key, you can actually get seriously hurt. Okay, you need to have the exact key to be able to hold it properly. So you can see that it's a very strange looking lock, which is not something that one normally sees on a daily basis. Now, this is the one that I told about, about 700 year old lock, where this slat is silver, this leg is silver. What would normally happen is, this slat will come out and the key will be applied here. And if the metal were the same, you would, you know, it, it would be so well finished, you wouldn't even be able to see a slat there. Because the whole thing will be flush with the iron and you can't even see where it is. I have done it in a contrasting way, 
just to show what the mechanism is. Now this is the lock which we talked about, the five key. I've kept it open now partially, but what happens is, basically you start from here, see this. More keyholes are getting revealed. One, two, three. Okay, so all the keyholes are revealed now. And then you will apply one key here. This is one. Another. It's not opening fully because I had kept one open, so it's here, but it's not open. You can't put anything through it. There. All the five keys when applied, one, two, three, four, and five, then it opens. So now, one by one, if you... Closed. And then you put it in and tighten it. There you go. So it's locked. Mm -hmm. uh, this actually today you can find it at least with three keys are easy to find among tourist shops, even in, uh, you know, in most tourist shops in Rajasthan and so on. Because they, they figured that this sells very well because it's very eye-catching. So three key versions are very commonly available. But this is also from Gujarat Rajasthan border. This is a very, very interesting lock. Though it, looking at it, nobody would imagine that there is anything special about this. There is a simple key, there is a simple lock. You see, now in all these locks, for instance, one principle was, here is one for instance, I, before I come back to that. You look at this lock, do you see keyhole anywhere? You don't. Now. Here the keyhole is completely concealed. In this the keyhole is completely concealed. But what you do is, when you open this one little rivet, this reveals the keyhole. Now if you look at this, it's so flush you can't even know that there will be a slat. And there are so many rivets, so you don't know which rivet is a functioning rivet. Your rivets on both sides. So you know which rivet is the functioning rivet. So on that rivet, if I apply, sorry. <laughs> yeah, there you are. There you go. It opens. Okay. Like even I am confused between whether it's this side or this side. So I have to try both. So if knowing it, is a challenge, someone who doesn't know the lock, obviously picking the lock takes that much longer, okay? So now you tighten the screw 
and pull it, the lock will open. That's it. Now, look at this. This is a beauty, actually. It's a lion eating a pig. Can you see that? Yeah. I think I should yeah, move some of move the locks. These, yeah. Here. Now, this stick has to be operated into this hole to remove the piglet. And when you remove the piglet, the keyhole is revealed. Okay? And none of these is a matter of seconds. You know, the, these locks were not like today's locks where you just turn the key and it opens. It takes about a minute, minute and a half to operate each lock and therefore I'm not going to actually work it. But you have to, the first puzzle is how do you get the piglet out? And that is a first level puzzle. The second level is to apply the key, which will remove this. Tail is a shackle. The tail is the shackle. So the lock would actually hang like this. Okay. Now. Yes. This you saw, which this is actually a typical Jain temple lock. You know, in most of these uh, temples, there will be those uh, smaller gods around the temples. Okay. Uh, Tirthankars or whoever, you know, 108 Tirthankars and so on. So these will be in those little temples. Uh, you know, there will be those little doors onto which these locks will be hanging. And this is a shackle. No. This is a shackle. Okay. And... Here, the key will be operated here on the head and the shackle will come out like this. This whole shackle will move out. All right. So I just thought that just to give you a little bit of idea about what these locks would look like. Now, there are about 700 locks and each of them is different from the other. You get to know about 20 locks, the 21st will still fox you. Okay. So, there is no such thing as, uh, you know, having learned the basics once, you are able to be comfortable with all other locks. Uh, and in fact, I have a good memory only for my locks, very little. L so, did any one of you get anywhere with this? This side, this side saw it. Yeah, but did you get to reveal the keyhole? No. Isn't it? There you go. Look at this. You may know where the slat is or whatever, but can you get to reveal the keyhole? See, the keys are both here. I am not even asking you to open the lock. I am saying, can you reveal the keyhole? I can make another round, another pass mm -hmm. through the hall, but you won't get anywhere, believe me. And actually this kind of a log gives you some insight into what uh, Houdini might have been up to. See, what would Houdini do typically? He'll show you the lock, like I've shown you the lock, and he'll say, is this a proper lock? You'll say, yeah, it's a proper lock. Is it solid? You'll say, yeah, it's solid. And then he'll say, okay, you lock me, you lock him. And then, hey, presto, he comes out. Okay, and that's exactly what is happening here. You tried, you know, at least 30, 40 of you have, even if each one gave one minute, in a way there were 30 man minutes spent on it and you don't get anywhere, right? And there you go. Again, keep it below and show it one more time. Yeah, no, magicians never tell, okay? Nor do lock men. Well, I, so I suspect Houdini didn't account for rusting when he went <laughs> underground on the last <laughs> one. Yeah, that can happen sometimes. You you can't help it. Thank you. You know, otherwise I, every day I'll be doing nothing but oiling all my logs. Uh, uh, there was one that you were going to uh, talk about. Yes, this is the one where one lock is for locking, down, 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 down. and the other is see. Look at the two keys. The two keys look very very different. Correct. 
they're not similar keys at all by a far shot yeah oh yeah yeah I we mean, can see it yeah okay the heads are very different and the keyhole is the same keyhole so both the keys will work on the normally if you apply a wrong key into a lock you find that you can't do a thing with it you know whereas here both the keys look very very different but one does the job of opening it the other does the job of closing it so this is what i said you would put it in a shop and say the shop assistant's job is to lock the shop and go but he doesn't have the right to come back so you leave this lock with him and then you go off so well so the ah yes i told you about this i said this lock looks very normal and what is so special about it now i said in this the keyhole was not visible at all so one trick was concealing the keyhole another trick there are locks where the keyhole is visible but they are pseudo keyholes they are not the right the right keyhole is concealed elsewhere but it makes you waste time on the pseudo keyhole you think you are picking the lock but you are actually doing nothing to the lock okay now this is a lock where the keyhole is this there is no other keyhole of course and this is the correct key but no matter what you do the key simply won't enter the lock at all you can try half an hour trying to fit this key you won't get anywhere actually i could again like this lock i could pass it on and you won't get anywhere but the problem is the moment you are told it looks very simple you know but but if you that, that's why magicians never tell because once they tell it looks very simple okay now in this lock for example this is actually the handle this is the business end of the key you see this this is the business end this is the handle side but this key is to be inserted from the handle side first let me take this out <laughs> you see this you put the handle in first and keep pulling it out and then the key goes in it opens you see this so if you put it directly the key won't enter at all but if you put the reverse end first then it end which means it's a topologically a very complex composition you have to understand three dimensional space in a very very unusual manner okay so and uh, as i said earlier the tail is the shackle the tail is a shackle no it's locked okay so well you know this is something uh, one could go on but the whole this is what that red booklet that you saw i had started uh, uh, cataloging how each one works and so on but you see you know especially when i was working all these years it was not easy to find enough time to document 700 different logs i did some 30 40 and stopped there now i'll probably start devoting a little more time but instead of maybe drawing it by hand i will do it on 3d and maybe digitalize it or whatever so that is a long five year project because this is not something which can be given to a third party to photograph because i have to be there to show how each lock works because these are not beautiful pieces which can be put in a museum because there's nothing visually very pleasant about them visually they're just a lump of metal but how they work is where the beauty comes in and for that i have to be myself be available for anyone who tries to photograph it and that's why the whole process is very slow and that's where I, you owe a big thanks for brought a very decent introduction to the whole thing so well that that's uh, part of the story <laughs> this Ravi Chandar honorary director of BIC chatted with Raghu post the live presentation and the floor was opened up to the audience for a Q&A
the challenge is to find a hero like <laughs> Raghunathan every time. Uh, this film uh, was made by with the effort of uh, Gaurav Krishna, Lekha Naidu, Dhruvatara. I was the driver who took them to the venue. And I was the guy who asked the chastity belt question. So you know what I was interested in. <laughs> so, uh, Raghu, we might as well start with the chastity belt. You said you wanted to buy it. What was the problem in buying one? <laughs> <laughs> My wife. <laughs> she would have thought I was buying it for her. <laughs> So first of all, thanks a lot for doing all this uh, from the film onwards. You and your team have done an outstanding job. And, uh, you know, it's been a pleasure all the way. Six months of high. Anyway, that said. Yeah, about this chest in a belt. You see, the belt is just a device which basically ensures that nobody can have access to what was considered private property in those days. But effectively, there used to be a padlock on it. Right. That, that's what I tried to say. So the interest that I have is not in built-in mechanisms, but padlocks. And the padlocks, there could be any of these, actually. So at any stage, given your interest in mathematic puzzles and the like, did Meena ever tell you that you should have taken to crypto? <laughs> because a lot of this is solving those kind of puzzles and things. So what do you say, Meena, instead of having those 700 locks at home, you would have had a lot of money in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> she said it 40 years ago, she's saying it today. <laughs> <laughs> so which really brings me, you know, see, uh, Raghu, I mean, uh, there's, been, there's Meena, you had this professorial life, there's a corporate career, an NGO life, and these locks. There's also the author and books. So how would you grade all these various... I know Meena will have to be top of the list for reasons well known. But how would you grade the rest in terms of your life's journey? Where would locks fit in this overall set of things that you have done? You see, as a matter of fact, uh, I've been lucky in the sense I have enjoyed each one of them, which I won't like to substitute for any other aspect of life because if something didn't interest me I didn't have to do it if I didn't enjoy teaching I didn't have to teach for 20 years if I didn't like the corporate life I didn't have to be there if I didn't like writing I didn't have to write 15 books if I didn't like collecting I didn't have to collect for 37 years and still be at it uh, so the fact is each of the, it's like if you have four children how do you decide which one do you love more you know so it's effectively actually like that so I think I've enjoyed each aspect of that. It's a secular religion of private kind, so to speak. And it goes parallel with everything else that you're doing. Whenever you have had too much of writing, you want a break, you know, you have something to fall back on. So hobby in that sense, in fact, one of the books that we are writing currently, the only project that me and I are doing together, is how important an early hobby is in life for... Uh, life to be more meaningful. It gives an extra dimension to your personality and so on. So what, what I was saying is... How about your uh, hobby? You're writing this that's book. That's right. So it goes parallelly with you through life and uh, you keep flitting in and out of it. There is no set time. But you see, what happens in life is if something genuinely... Profession often we do because you want to earn money. But when it comes to a hobby, there is no compulsion. There is right. no reason why you are doing it. You are doing it because it's just for pleasure. In fact, I've gone to the extent of saying, you know, if you say cognition is what distinguishes man from animals, that is not true. Elephants and all kinds of other animals are known to have cognition. Even religion, I believe elephants have their own rituals about the dead elephants and kangaroos are supposed to have, no, llamas are supposed to have some, uh, you know, they, they stand still in front of a dead llama and so on. So they have a sort of spirituality built into right. them. So anything else that you talk about, humans are not unique. Right. But when it comes to hobby... Now, you might say, well, even a bird collects pebbles and spoons and uh, knickknacks and gym tracks, but it does that more for uh, to attack mates. Right. Okay, it's like you may buy a bigger car in case your wife is threatening to leave you. Did anybody whatever. show interest okay. in you after your lock collection? <laughs> <laughs> Since you say it's about so, attracting so the, mates. <laughs> yeah, no, so the point is... Uh, Hobby is what genuinely distinguishes human beings from animals. No animal is known to collect for the pleasure of collecting. 
okay so you well if i were a sociologist i would have hypothesized it and done a hypothesis testing and so on and would have called this a principle of raghunathan mean or whatever but that is the beauty of hobby and that is why you know it has never come in the way of anything and it if anything it has enriched life at large it's been fascinating in fact i've yeah. always thought of you as a polymath and this is another aspect of you that's very interesting now you focused on indian locks uh, any particular reason why you chose not to look at other locks was it because of the rbi forex rules that didn't allow dollar payments <laughs> not so much that but affordability was an angle for sure you see first of all if i collected only indian locks there was a purpose to it i was trying to keep the indian heritage in india in fact in my early years i found i was competing with these guys who would collect locks from the same sources and sell it to those antique shops behind the taj right. in bombay and much of these locks used to be bought by foreigners and they'll find their way out of india so i said okay you know and of course at that time it's not as if the whole forward the uh, the path was chalked out in my mind but the idea was let us try to keep something of india within india but then again also the set is smaller when you talk only about a limited uh, geography the moment is a world then where does the world end is it 50 countries 100 countries 150 countries and who has infinite uh, uh, resources to spread oneself so thin my friend this uh, dr hiran shah yeah. has from 60 different so countries so i was coming to that what is it about ahmedabad and lock collectors because you were in ahmedabad when this hit that's you that's right yeah. so what is it so sabarmati water no as i told you gujarat rajasthan and uh, uh, eastern pakistan or western india old india had a lock culture because those were border areas where through the desert these caravans would have to go long distances and therefore they were very heavy in making padlocks so that region developed that's also the reason why jammu kashmir uh, nepal is another border because there used to be a lot of trade with china which again used to go in big boxes and therefore padlocks were uh, uh, you know a key uh, accessory to those so that's the reason why amdabad has a whole lot of this uh, and also you won't find a tamilian doing the hard work going from village to village collecting locks gujaratis do it you know that far too many middlemen who are gujaratis than a tamilian you know so there and you they, are i guess a sense of business opportunity also <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> now uh, moving on you know one of the things that you know he asked us to do and you mentioned that one of your big locks is actually in the ing gate yeah. you asked us to go and photograph it yeah. and we never got around to doing it and therefore it's not in the film it was there in the uh, antique collectors in magazine the, and they are in the magazine yes right. so can you just talk a little bit about yeah. that big lock and uh, your decision because that's the only lock i think there are seven of them actually with, no, and yeah. it is there in the there are seven of them not one okay seven in fact those of you whose uh, uh, way home goes through mg road now uh, as soon as you enter mg road going from here the oberoi will come to your right on the left you know as soon as you go from under the railway station right there on the left hand side you will see the old ing vaisha house the current kotak house which is the kotak banks headquarters today there will be seven locks in blown up 4 uh, feet bronze uh, along the curb but inside the perimeter of uh, the bank which uh, when uh, uh, mr ramurthy here was my chairman and i was a president at the bank uh, and i was in charge of doing that corporate building at that time uh we needed something to you know which stood for safety and security for the bank and i thought locks represented safety and security very well and it was my hobby and here i could indulge in a bit of hobby at uh, bank's money which the you know the chairman uh, uh, good for me you know agreed and we had some uh, sculptors uh, 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 do these seven locks and each one has a small brass plate talking about what the original lock where it is from and what its original dimensions are and so forth mm -hmm. so and also the idea was that the bank wanted to do something for the public you know which was accessible to public but safe within the premises and that is why we put it on the boundary wall so that even pedestrians outside could take a look but it was safe within the boundaries of the wall so, so that is where we came so from so that's an exercise for everyone to do 
Bangalore. So when you go past that Kotak Bank on MG you Road, take a look. please take a look. And given in Bangalore's traffic, you can even jump out, see it and come back. Because I was keen on it because India is not a country of great public aesthetics. We don't see as many good uh, installations in traffic squares and so on as we see in Europe, for instance, or even in a Shanghai, for instance. And I was always keen that we needed a little bit of quality uh, aesthetics and public spaces. And this was part of that offshoot. And, uh, you know, the other thing, I don't know how many of you read uh, Raghu's article about two, three days ago about the Yogi and the NSC <laughs> exchange. So, you know, he talked about Mahabharata locks and this thing. So I'm sure there's an alternate calling in understanding how yogis work, etc., which I think you might have, you might be privy to. That is one thing which is uncrackable in this country. <laughs> how yogis work. <laughs> Where did you do your mechanical engineering? I didn't do engineering at all. Yeah, that's I'm what I... I'm a BSc in physics, chemistry and maths. That's what I suspected because last time we had Raghunandan who did the train model and he also didn't have an engineering background. Those are amazing. So the hypothesis that gets proved is stay away from engineering if you want to work <laughs> with mechanical stuff. <laughs> that's right. Meena's brother was a rocket scientist. He passed away. He was a Padma Shri and... Uh, once, I think when he was doing, he finished his engineering, Meena's chain had come off from her moped. And he said, I don't know anything. I don't know. This is not something. I, he couldn't put the chain back on the moped. <laughs> <laughs> so that's so much for an engineer. <laughs> In fact, you spoke about the gills. You know, the English gills are very famous and popular. And also the whole issue of skilling. Why is it that Indians per se, I mean, the older people had it, as India as a society had it. What made us lose that whole working with hands and skilling? And Because today that's looked down and then we say vocational training initiative and the like. What accounts for this love for this kind of engineering kind of stuff and uh, no love for, like Germany, for instance, it doesn't matter whether you're a carpenter or you go on to become a doctor. The standing is the That's same. That's a good question, actually. I think largely it's because we have lost the respect for uh, manual labor. And I think it's a question of demand and supply of labor. Wherever you have a huge population, labor is an easy supply. And what is easily available has lower value. Okay, gold has high value because it's more difficult to get. Okay. At one stage during Napoleon's time, aluminium was the most expensive metal because it had just been, you know, they had just found aluminium as a metal and it was a rare metal at the time. So it was more precious than gold. So I think because manpower is cheap in this country, manual labor is also cheap. We don't, was, uh, uh, that, so we that, don't have the do-it-yourself culture. We don't have the do-it-yourself culture. How many of us sitting in this hall will say, I'm fine if my son becomes a great plumber? You know, we don't. You know, whereas a plumber elsewhere will be indistinguishable from a surgeon. He'll come wearing a similar <laughs> garb. He'll probably drive a better car and uh, all of that. You know, we don't have that. So we lost it. The other thing, of course, and that's my last closing thing, is with this whole shift to digital. One, of course, is the mass production of locks and also where you want the physical thing. This kind of craft, in a sense, has almost disappeared. And that's one level. The other thing is with the crypto and software and those controlling this thing. I guess this is going to be a past chapter for sure. Yeah. Unless you make NFT of some of these locks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you make non-fungible tokens, they may sell, but yeah. not on their own. So maybe you should try an <laughs> NFT and put it out, uh, Raghu. Yeah, I know. I'll Meena. Some good Samaritan, mean, anyone, mm -hmm. put your hands up. <laughs> we, we are, the, between the two of us, we are very, very, you know, untech savvy, so to speak. So we but, will but need what someone. you have shown there, I think, beats most tech. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so anybody any, yeah, no, any questions? questions. So it's open Whatever to the questions. thing. Yeah, please, please come there and ask the question. My name is Ramanathan. I'm a, I was a scientist with DRDO. Oh, yes, uh, Mr. Ramanathan. Thank you for a fantastic lecture and your collection is really great. Thank you. I just have a small suggestion. Yeah. When you're documenting, maybe you could make a small brief video on each log 
and how it opens and closes absolutely yeah that is one you side. you've gladdened my wife's heart because she's been telling me for years that i need to make a video of each of the lock yeah. but you know yes that's true but as i said it it takes my own time and yeah. i'm also a fairly regular author yeah. so as it is in order to write i have to read because one who doesn't read can't write and between the two of them i have to find time for my logs and videograph them uh, i mean you know it's, it's a slow process but i'll get there some day sure. and incidentally since you are from drdo i may tell you that i did try seeking drdo's help once okay. to understand if the metal the metals could be dated could but be. even they told me that no you know 200 300 400 year kind of a time frame cannot be easily dated because the metallurgy is all mixed up while metallurgy cannot be dated uh, perhaps some mm. organic deposits so uh, inside the log which may still be there probably they can be dated yeah. we'll be able to roughly guess the but organic the deposits will not be there in all the logs yeah, they have all been repeatedly been washed in yeah. kerosene and yeah. you know what That's not and so on so it's a far shot yeah. and, and which drdo will do it for me on a commercial basis you right. know <laughs> unless it's a part of one of their missiles yeah exactly <laughs> sir, uh, uh, could I t- tell a small story? Yes, sir. Uh, you must have heard of uh, Richard Feynman. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, of yeah, course, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Nobel laureate. Yes, yes. Uh, he used to work in Las Alamos uh, during the yes, yes. Uh, first uh, atom bomb. Correct. Uh, when he was made the uh, one of the members of the uh, investigation team of the Challenger crash, uh, as a part of the investigation, he went there after maybe uh, four or five decades, or three or four decades. then he uh, he was curious to uh, go to the room where he used to work and he was given a table which had a, a, a you know a combination lock and he was standing behind you know hiding the combination lock and he was uh, able to open the lock and the people uh, who took his place after him they had not changed that combination at all and the combination was the original <laughs> combination <laughs> yes i've read that anecdote very true actually many of these combination locks particularly it's not just a mechanical thing it's also a question of guesswork most people will say you know their name at 1 2 3 or it will be 4 3 2 1 or birthday or bank number and so forth so understanding people's psychology very well what a person is likely to use that kind of guesswork so in two or three iteration you quickly it's like wordle you know in five iteration in six iterations you decode a five letter word so in a way that's what you do a five digit code you are trying to decode using some understanding of the person concerned so it's a wordle of sorts you know so yes you are right he he did that and he said nobody had changed that that uh, combination in a long time that's uh, right thank you uh, which one of these is your favorite lock pet lock again as i said there's no one favorite the topography one is my favorite for one reason this big lock that i showed you where i just opened it like that is my favorite for another reason and uh, this one is my favorite for yet another reason and so forth so depending on you know uh which dimension i'm looking at i have different favorites i guess it's the mood of the day yes, sir. And, sir, <laughs> and, uh, if if you don't mind uh, uh would you just uh, give us some rough cost of some of the locks okay uh the range incidentally i where is my phone meena has got the figures <laughs> no no they, yesterday somebody sent me this lock supposedly made by the ottoman empire and gifted to some indian uh rich man it's about 17 inches tall 11 inches wide and 4 inches deep now this guy knows that i collect locks and he knows i don't have this lock so when i said what is the price he said 3 and 1/2 lakhs he would have added two zeros at least <laughs> okay i'm sure now the point the reason i'm mentioning this is and again that's not the only thing you know there have been locks where i've told the man to take a flight and come but he comes with 10 or 12 locks and i pick 3 or 4 now where do i load the airfare on which lock so there are problems challenges of actually costing a lock 
Okay. Again, a lock bought for 25,000 rupees 18 years ago and bought for 40,000 rupees today cannot be compared. Okay. What discounting rate do I apply? So there are challenges of all kinds, but yes, you know, in my earlier days, relatively speaking, in absolute terms, the rupee amount spent was lower. But today there have been locks I paid. I have personally not paid more than 50,000 for a lock. Because I know that when they add these lakhs and so on, I just keep it away because I know it's not worth that. So finally they come down. Like my that big lock, the one that I said is 25 kgs, was from the same source who quoted a lakh and a half almost 18 years ago, but I paid 50,000 and I bought it. So they can be anywhere in between. So Thank you very much. Sir. But overall, is it an expensive hobby? Has it been an expensive hobby? It has been expensive. But I think because, the return on investment but, but has been worth it. Asymptotically uh, so. In the sense, the, the rarer a lock gets in your position, the more you are willing to pay. And also in your later stages is when you are financially more well off and you are willing to pay more. Okay. 50, uh, 30 years ago, if somebody said a lakh, I said, go to hell, it's not even my area. Today, when someone says a lakh, I say, okay, let me look at it. Okay. So that, that, that's how. But it has given you a lot of joy. A lot of uh, joy. Maybe so. Meena grief, but uh, overall return no, on Meena investment. Meena is okay been, uh, now, <laughs> but she used to be, you know, I would often tell her 30% of the price I had paid for a lot. I was a, uh, you know, professor in IIM Ahmedabad, <laughs> living on a salary and uh, so on. And uh, I would have paid some 2,000 rupees for a lock. She would say, how much did you pay for it? I'll say 700. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there was a lot of lying involved. Uh, but now she's come to terms she understands the uh, you know that it's been a good uh, sweet no, this is a really fascinating and tremendous amount of admiration of thank course you. for you and for the collection thank I'm you i'm curious with some of these locks where uh, let's say the one that requires five keys or some of the others how many of these do you think would have been made because uh, how many normal people would have had use cases for for things like this so as a consequence are you able to sense uh, you know how many of of such pieces exist around was one question and uh, the second was uh, how much time do you spend maintaining some of these and what does that involve? Okay. Thanks. The first question is impossible to estimate. You see, uh, these are all uh, uh, local industries, village level industries actually. So I would imagine that most villagers sourced their logs from one locksmith and he would make each one as a, a, a bespoke piece for each one. But some of them caught on, you know, the basic principles then would be replicated in the neighboring village and the neighboring village and so on. So it's very difficult to make any kind of an estimate. Uh, we are not able to estimate our COVID cases, number of tests and so on. Uh, <laughs> you're talking about. <laughs> so anyway, uh, but, but your second question was? Uh, How about maintaining? Uh, maintenance. You see, when the numbers were smaller, I would not have these embarrassing moments that you talked about. Okay? <laughs> because each of them would work because every weekend but I oil. spent some time and so on. But now with 700 of them, my own career over a period of time, having been busy, many other things to do, you know, I let them go to rest. In fact, uh, today, somebody has just passed on some very nice uh, sprays from Germany who have brought them and their driver is passing it on to my driver so that I can spray them inside so the, to actually counter this uh, rusting problem, for instance. So that's happening even as we speak now. Yeah, so today I don't devote so much time. And my poor uh, wife, Mina and my driver have their hands full trying to keep the cabinet free of dust. <laughs> yeah, please come. No, a slightly uh, facetious question. Uh, In the course of your research, did you come across any interesting stories about keychains people carried in those days for all these fancy... Uh, that's, <laughs> a good good question. that's a good question. Actually, uh, some of those are the size of a hockey stick. And, uh, you know, I, I had shown some picture <coughs> where two and a half feet was the length of the... Actually, more than two and a half feet. Two feet... Eight inches is the length of the key. Now, what kind of a keychain you can think of? You don't know. Maybe you need a saddle with a holder on the side <laughs> of a horse. Uh, but in the olden days, they used to wear them as rings. 
you know, the Egyptians used to have uh, keys in their rings. Maybe that is why the key ring concept itself probably came from, I don't know, but I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, uh, thinking. But yes, most of these uh, would have been a challenge to carry. But that's why, you see, once the uh, gunpowder came in, most of these locks became irrelevant. Because it's easier to blast the door. Why blast the lock? You know, why work at the lock? You know, most of these locks have no relevance talking about picking the lock. Because you can't pick, you, you have to hammer with a foundry there to make a key for them, you know. So uh, that, that's why most of these disappeared after uh, probably the gunpowder started coming in. You know, Good. easy to blast the door. Uh, any uh, interesting stories on how some of these locks have come into you? I mean, in a sense, uh, have there been some that have just landed in your lap, whereas somewhere you've come about, you've learned about it and gone chasing after those locks oh, yeah, and yeah, finding yeah, them? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So See, what's the right. mix from your Absolutely. Your See, in my early years, I was chasing. Wherever I went, I would look at the flea market. I'll go to those uh, old uh, junk markets and so on, physically forage around and so forth. But, you know, only then, it's like this. Anything in life you get into actually opens up a new world. Then I realized that there are people watching you when you go to this flea market. And once you've made three visits to a flea market, there are some broker or a, a intermediary guy who has noticed you looking for locks three or four times in a row. Then he would very slyly come next to you and say, Sab aap tala dekhte hai, kya? Aap tala bechte hai, kya? Then you say, nahi, bechta nahi hu, main kharitta hu, collect karta hu. Chaliye, hum aapko dikhate hai tala. <laughs> so I used to deal with, and Meena would uh, tell me, you know, all kinds of shady characters on weekends will come and press the bell and say, Saab hai kya? Uh, Meena will say, kya aap koon hai? No, no, wo saab ko boliye, uh, thoda milne ko. You know, very shady looking characters. So I've done all of that. I've gone to Aligarh. I've gone shop to shop and so on. But over a period of time, the intermediaries found me. Then they would call me from Jodhpur, from Udaipur, from, uh, you know, all of Delhi and so on. I would pay them their uh, 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 train fare or airfare or whatever. And now they come over here. Even here in Bangalore, they've come from Jodhpur and so on. So today they find me. I don't go around so much. But then the rate of acquisition has also come down significantly. <laughs> no, I thought reading the book was a pleasure, but this video and hearing you is always. So I was just wondering, see, you said the lack of documentation and no way to date them. But usually there is some oral history, folklore, songs, particularly, you know, in tribal areas, uh, in any culture, any tradition, if you see. Isn't there any reference to any of these things, any historical fiction or art or as part of the folklore, stories, fables, songs that you've come across? Not, not in my uh, okay. forays, no. Okay. I don't recall anything uh, okay. of any kind. Uh, nothing seriously at any rate. Okay. Um, but you could write know. the whole thing of fiction around each of these yes. locks. Yeah, yeah. I found maybe. it curious because is it possibly, you know, maybe that it was really thought that something that should not be... Those be who would know such things, you can't even crowdsource them. Mm -hmm. See, supposing I put it on the internet, for yeah. ideas. These are not the people who are going to see it. Yeah, and true. those who are going to see it are not the ones who will be on folklore. <laughs> you know, yeah. so it's a, it's a mugs game. So, Thank you. not at all. Any of you watched the film Uksa? When you were talking about yes. it, the locking mechanism of the jewelry that she wears, and Utsav is supposed to be researched on history. Ah. And he takes a lot of time to figure, but finally it's one pin and all her jewelry will come yeah. down. Correct. Yeah, but so I Wait think there must I'll, be I'll because apparently you. that jewelry was researched when I read about the paper. Quite likely. Yeah. Yes. No, but was, since you talk was. about jewelry locks, look at this. This is the tiniest lock. Wow. And wow. properly functioning lock. Look at the key. Oh my God. It's a proper per functioning <laughs> so you see this is a tiny here is another one very very tiny and this is with the key so it's looking longer but the without the key it's just this 
so these are actually uh, for little jewelry boxes you have a ring in a box and you just put that little lock on that and so on yes oh. Raghu, how do you protect your locks at home? <laughs> yeah, that, you see, people, I... People all know that you have right. a long collection. The only thing is nobody can carry a ton and run very far. Okay. <laughs> and I did have the Tata AIG MD visiting me because I had complained that, look, you guys are not uh, insuring it. He came home. Okay. And uh, at the end of it all, the bottom line was you need a gunman and an iron room. <laughs> now, how, how do you do that in a household? And I would rather spend that money on a few more logs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and also valuation. Valuation is a yeah, huge question a mark. That's what is it? To me, the fact that I paid 10,000 for this lock is not the value. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, if at all I were to insure it, I would want to value it for much higher. But then the premium goes up. And then premium goes up even further if you don't have the lock man. A gunman. So, you know, it's, so it's a difficult thing. So, I, it's a, uh, uh, the, the only thing is the market is so small, if anybody tries to sell it, we'll get to know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, so secondly, you did not tie Karekal and Karekudi, those areas. I have, I have been. I but have there been. were nothing. There, there, are, there are a few with me. Oh, there are okay. a few from Karekudi and uh, so on also. Okay. But not very many because, yes, they were, those, those were also there because granary trade to China yeah. or uh, Far East used to happen from Tamil Nadu side. Okay, okay. And they used to use those locks on the granaries. Okay. So South India, even Kerala has a fairly healthy uh, uh, ancient uh, lock industry. I mean, uh, locks which are resold now. It's not an industry anymore. But yes, I do have some from there. Do the sellers tell you the mechanism before you buy that? Unless yeah. and until they share that? Yeah. Do no, you... some do, some don't. Some don't know. So you break your... Then I break it myself. Yes. But it's easier if they tell me uh, yeah. because it saves me time. I know I'll be able to do it, but it takes too much time. So if they tell me, it's easier on me. But if they are, if they don't know at all, like some locks where I didn't even have uh, the keys, yes. I had to find, you know, make the keys myself. Those are time consuming and I figure out myself. Well, I compliment you on your futuristic thinking of digitalizing the entire yeah. one. Uh, yeah, but I saw, your, <laughs> I saw your beautiful writing. It's like a Vyasa's. Mahabharata being written. <laughs> so don't give it up. I think Thank complete you. that. Thank complete you so that. Much. And then retain it as a memory that sir. later a point of time people will use it. Thank as you. Some sir. Of those Thanks a lot. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And on that note, it's uh, time to close. And thank you, Raghu, Thank for you doing all this very so much. much. Thank you so much.